I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, it's going to be about GDPR and security, but I've got on a kind of a, a kind of story I want to tell you around this whole 72-hour data breach deadline. So I'll hopefully uh, uh, uncover some of the uh, strangeness that's going to be up ahead with GDPR. Firstly, I must let you all know, I, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, and for any of you that are quite pedantic, I'm not a counselor, barista, solicitor, attorney. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I am a nerd from Sophos. Uh, and I'm very interested in security uh, and also legislation, it seems. So I'm also going to talk to you about uh, you know, how uh, security and, and the things that we do as a, as a vendor can help you kind of protect yourself against some of these horrible uh, fines that can come from uh, GDPR. What I have to point out, though, is that uh, here's a little bit of a disclaimer. Sophos, of course, is not a legal firm. Uh, we're a security vendor. So uh, by that very nature, uh, this, is, uh, this is not uh, solid legal advice. And of course, we highly recommend you speak to uh, your, legal, uh, your, your legal counsel uh, regarding any kind of concerns of GDPR. The uh, disclaimer aside, let's talk about uh, what happened back in 1995. So in 1995, a thing called the EU Directive 9546EC uh, came into being. Uh, now, for any of you who don't know what a directive is, a directive is, is kind of a, like a skeletal framework. It's like a goal uh, so, uh, that, that, that needs to be sort of implemented into local law by each member state. So in 95, uh, the EU decided they wanted to do some kind of data protection laws. Uh, and so they created a directive that explains the kind of the goals and, and kind of what the outcome or, you know, of, a, of a law should be. And then each individual member state had to write up their own law to implement this directive. Uh, and that's how in the United Kingdom we have the Data Protection Act in 1998. But just again, to sort of put things into perspective, in 1995, USB was not even released. It was a release candidate to manufacturers. So we didn't even have flash memory sticks or anything like that. We were still using serial ports. PHP, JavaScript, two of the, uh, one of the kind of the earliest and widely used uh, technologies to get, give us an interactive experience on the web, uh, pretty critical for dynamic websites like social networks and so on. Well, PHP and JavaScript are only just being released in 1995. The default color of the internet was gray, not white. Uh, Netscape Navigator was the king of all web browsers at the time. And we didn't have the verb Google, as in you wouldn't tell someone to go and Google that. You would probably go and tell them to go and alter Vista that. We had three years until we had Google from this point. Uh, and let me alter Vista that for you isn't quite a catchy phrase. Furthermore, 1% of UK households had access to the internet in 1995 in comparison to it's so around 86% or so of UK households that have access to the internet in 2015. So this law was created in a very, very, very different time with very different concerns about privacy. You know, there was more concern around paper records and filing cabinets at this day and age, while the internet was kind of just a novelty that a few people had access to. And of course, now in comparison to now, well, we all know that the internet is almost ubiquitous and, and it's pretty much the primary way that we even share information. So that's where GDPR comes in. So let's give a quick whirlwind tour of what GDPR actually is. So the GDPR, or let's give it its full name, the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, is a new, York, new law that's designed to strengthen the privacy of EU citizens. And when I say strengthen the privacy of, of EU citizens, actually the, the reading of the GDPR kind of almost eludes that it might even refer to EU residents. So this is one of the strange things about the GDPR, and we'll talk about this as we go along, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's relatively fluffy in various areas for, for good reason, and this is one of them. So in comparison to it being about someone who is a citizen and thus Brexit would happen and we'd no longer be within the EU, the GDPR actually covers uh, someone who is currently resident within the EU. So if you're on holiday or something within the EU, in theory, your data should be protected by the General Data Protection Regulation. That's an interesting uh, consideration for any organization that's collecting data. So this law is going to affect all organizations that hold personally identifiable information uh, on EU citizens and residents. And this affects organizations even if they're outside the EU. So the GDPR is a very different type of legislation. It's not a, a framework or something. It's quite literally a pan-European law, but it's not just targeting businesses within the EU for, you know, to make them comply, but the actual law targets the uh, European residents and citizens and their data and then anyone who has that data then has to keep that secure. So that could mean uh, even a, an American company, should they have any records or personal identifiable information on a European resident within their data set, it means they actually need to be in, uh, in, uh, in compliance with the General Data Protection Regulation. 
And just for any of you that aren't aware what I meant by personally identifiable information, I'm talking about health data, email addresses, photographs, biometrics like fingerprints and facial scans, and retina scans, or, or social security numbers, national identity numbers, etc. Anything, any kind of data that you could use to point at a human being. So when is this happening? Well, enforcement begins on the 25th of May 2018. That's right, this isn't just something that we're contemplating or the EU is currently sort of ratifying. It's already happened. This has already been passed. All the motions are, have been carried, and now uh, we're just waiting for the law to actually become enforced. It's already in place. It's just enforcement of it doesn't begin. It's to give people a you know, kind of a run-up to, to, uh, to sort of uh, uh, the GDPR. So we've not got long until it actually becomes uh, you know, something that's actually going to start incurring people's fines and whatnot. So the GDPR really, its main purpose is to give uh, the supervisory authorities greater powers, some might say sharper teeth, uh, to take action against businesses that fall foul of these new laws. So for example, you know, by losing data or not following these data protection requirements, uh, you could end up with quite a, a nasty fine. And this is what most people have been talking about. So let's put that on the screen. These tough penalties can be, uh, can be anything up to 20 million euros or 4% of annual global revenue, whichever is greater. Um, and, and as you can think, uh, you know, for, for, for if any of you have been following the fines that have been given up by the ICO, some of these fines have been nowhere near the scale before. As we can see, you know, with all the other costs that are also going to be incurred by businesses, should you have a data breach, it's not just these fines you know, that you've got to be worried about. You've got the concern of uh, you know, how much it's going to cost you to investigate the breach, to put uh, security measures in place to repair from it for lots of customers and so on. And with that sort of talk, uh, sorry, with that, with that uh, sort of uh, in mind, let's talk about Talk Talk. Uh, you know, this is a talk talk had a rather unfortunate data breach. Uh, again, not nothing I would wish upon any kind of organisation. Um, but there's something very interesting we can mention about this. Looking at the fine that was imposed upon them by the ICO. So let's look at the data breach itself. They lost 157,000 customer records in, in their data breach, which included 15,000 bank account details. So it's quite a sizable chunk of data, especially for a, uh, a country that you know, sorry, a business that pretty much only runs within one, you know, within the UK. So According to their annual, well, sorry, their, their quarterly financial report that they published shortly after the data breach, it, the, the data breach actually cost them 60 million their business, uh, in part due to losing 101,000 customers, but also due to having to implement all these security measures and do audits and, and et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of, you know, not only did they have this whopping loss of business, which, which can't have been a very comfortable thing to experience, but then they were also imposed a 400,000 pound fine from the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, currently kind of the, the supervisory authority of the Data Protection Act. Okay. This fine, this, this £400,000 fine is pre-GDPR. So what would that fine have been should GDPR have been in place? So uh, again, taken from that same report there, their, their quarterly uh, sort of report they published, that would equal about a £59 million fine to represent 4% of their revenue, uh, their, their uh, annual revenue. And that's a 14,650% increase over what the ICO could impose. That's an obscene uh, increase. I mean, that's what, 147.5 uh, no, uh, times increase. But that's a, you know, that, this is what we mean by this sharper teeth that, that, that this, this regulation brings into, uh, into force. Instead of, a, you know, the GT, uh, instead of a supervisory authority being able to sort of sting them with a small slap on the wrist, which is maybe something like a 400,000 pound fine, a 59 million pound fine. I mean, for many businesses, you know, something, anything of the scale of 20 million euros would would sink, you know, the vast majority of any small medium enterprise in the United. So this is kind of what what it's about. It's to then put the I like to say that the fire under our feet to start really and truly thinking about security and thinking about privacy and and protecting customer data and, and making sure that we've done everything that we can to keep it secure. And these kind of fines are there to sort of loom over us to make us a little bit fearful. Uh, of course, there's no prior case law yet. You know, it's not actually an enforcement. So we don't know how, you know, uh, how, you know, how hard hitting they're going to be, whether they're going to uh, uh, really impose these heavy fines in a large majority of the cases or only in a select few or, or almost never. Are they just going to have that power that they don't, but not actually wield it? So let's talk about these data breach deadlines, because I think this is an interesting part of the GDPR. I'm going to extract out a, a couple of sections from the actual legislation itself. So 72 hours, and what we mean by this is about uh, organizations have to announce a data breach to the supervisor authority within 72 hours. So let's look at the actual wording of that. In the case of a personal data breach, the controller shall 
without undue delay and, wherever feasible, not later than 72 hours after having become aware of it, notify the personal data breach to the supervisory authority. So let's look at that first, word, that first thing I've highlighted there, without undue delay. What does that mean? <laughs> and, and the interpretation of the GDPR is often very, you know, it's, it's quite open. It's, it's uh, something we could probably sit around and debate for, for days on end. Uh, and, and this is kind of what they've, they've intended for. You know, it, they want to create a legislation that can stay relevant. And so should you have had a very minor data breach that didn't really matter, then, you know, if you had a delay, uh, actually, that's not a good example. Let's say, uh, let's say you'd lost uh, a very large sum of data but it was due to an ongoing and current attack, right? You were still being attacked by this attacker and a data breach already occurred. And so, you know, announcing it was quite difficult while you're still in the middle of tackling, you know, an actual, you know, uh, currently ongoing attack. And so that might be a due delay because you had uh, a lot of other priorities. You still had to secure your environment that was uh, because you were still facing that attack. But if you'd had a sort of a, just had a database get uh, compromised remotely and the, the data breach has already occurred and there's really other than just sort of locking it down and, and, and doing a root cause, you've already kind of incurred the kind of loss and there's no ongoing kind of action, then really taking longer than 72 hours is what you could possibly argue as being undue. And so this is where the, the GDPR, uh, I, again, I say it's fluffy, but it's fluffy for good reason. It's so that the GDPR can, uh, it's, well, it's so that it puts the ball in the supervisory authorities' court. You know, it's going to let them, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, look at all the facts around the data breach and then be able to impose a, a fine that's relative to the kind of the mistakes that have been made, the negligence, uh, or even the good efforts that have been made to try and you know, secure things. And maybe if it's just an unfortunate, uh, you know, really difficult thing to protect against, they can be lenient. All right, so that's uh, from Article 33, uh, Section 1. I'm now going to just jump back one section uh, and highlight this because, you know, when, if we, so uh, actually, let me just take, a second to talk about this one more uh, for just a little bit longer. So with 72 hours, you know, we're talking about we've got to be able to detect it and then notify in 72 hours. But what if we can't detect it? What if we never detect that we've had a data breach? Or, or, are we still in compliance? What, what does that mean? Well, throughout the GDPR, we see this kind of phrasing, and, and this is from Article 32. Um, but here you can see uh, this is probably what I mean by, by the fluffiness. So let's talk about this one. Taking into account the state of the art, the cost of implementation and the nature, scope, context, and purposes of processing, as well as the risk of varying likelihood and severity for the rights and freedoms of natural persons, the controller and the processor shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. Okay, that was quite a meaty paragraph. I don't, know, I don't expect all of you to be able to follow that at this time in the morning. Let's, let's try and pick that apart. So let's look at that first bit, the state of the art. So state of the art makes the GDPR relevant at all times because what state of the art today in five years' time is going to be possibly a commodity product, and and this means that you know if you're looking at technology and solutions to implement, uh, you know they're they're telling you upfront you should be taking into account what the state of the art is to secure you know whatever uh, you know either avenue of attack or or you know, solution you're using let's say you're using databases well what's the state of the art technique to protect the database. And so this means that at all times the GDPR is pretty much up to date. Um, and so that's the first part, state of the art. And it's telling you, you've got to take that into account. You've got to consider, you know, consider what is the best solution on the market at the time or the best method or the best process or the best, you know, you know whatever really, to, to secure or, or protect you know, uh, the, the risk that you're trying to mitigate. Then it takes into account the costs of implementation. So, of course, if it's uh, state of the art, uh, would be to implement uh, retinal scanners across all of your sites to protect uh, your filing cabinets and so on. You know, well, the cost of implementation of that, especially if you have a thousand different, you know, uh, offices all over the world. Well, okay, fair enough. We understand that the cost of implementing that technology is possibly a bit too 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 out of reach of the, you know, either your organisation or just you know the the, the, the risk. Uh, let's say if you look at how for like an insurer would, you know, what's the, 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 the risk going to be for its cost, you know, how much would it cost to, uh, if that data was lost, and then how much would it cost to implement that, if something to mitigate that. So that's something else you have to take into account. Then we've got the nature, scope, context, and purposes of processing. This is basically saying, you know, there's a, if you're only collecting uh, email addresses to send them you know, a marketing email, and losing these, those email addresses uh, isn't so much of a risk, because all you lost was that email address. But should you be gathering people's fingerprints uh, because you're a police force or something like that, and you lost a police, uh, you lost a, a, a some of 
fingerprint records. Well, a fingerprint is something that uh, it, you know it can't be reset by a user. It's not like a password where you can change it. Fingerprint is something that someone has for life, and this is the same thing like American social security numbers. They're very difficult to change. So once breached, they can impact that person for the rest of their life. They can enable someone to uh, to, to, to sort of uh, create a bank account in their name or something like that. And that again steps into when I say into the whole varying likelihood and severity for the rights and freedoms of natural rights. Okay. I.e., what's the the chance that you might actually lose this data? Uh, you know, how likely is it to be attacked? How likely is it to be breached? And how would that impact you know, the severity for the rights and freedoms? How will that actually impact those individuals if that data is lost? So again, we've got to take all of this into account um, with all of these considerations. It then states the controller and the processor. So to, to explain that, the controller is effectively the, 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 the sort of the organization of the individuals that are collecting the data in the first place. So for instance, uh, you know, uh, if you're a customer of SoftCat, they are the controller of your data as you purchase from them and so on. But any kind of payment processor that they use or anyone to do their, you know, to, to, to do the transactions, well, that's the processor, right? And that, but it means that actually the, the security of this data is both responsible, not just by the controller as it previously has been in, in the past, but now it's also the processor as well. Everyone is responsible to protect that data at all times. So it's in the controller and the processor had to implement appropriate, that's a very fluffy word, technical, also fluffy, and organizational Fluffy measures, fluffy. Okay, so as you can probably guess, this is this this here is the, I think the the crux of the GDPR is that it's basically saying you've got to take into account what the best technology is, and if it's uh, and if it's uh, as long as it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg, and if it's the right technology you should be using to protect data of a certain type because of the risks to it if it was lost, then you should implement that. Uh, be it a technical measure, you know, te uh, technical measure being hardware, software, but also organizational measures like changing how your business works, changing the processes and, and how data flows through your business, uh, whether your IT st uh, staff can access certain systems or restricting down which members of staff have access to the payroll information and things like that. All of this is, is uh, you know, relevant and, and it's part of an appropriate technical organization, uh, organizational measure to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. This doesn't really give you any guidance of what you should do. It just tells you that you should do it and it should all be relevant uh, to the risk. It's, in, it, it's very difficult to interpret because this means that this is always ever changing. If we look at this now, what, you know, if we're talking about uh, the risks to uh, an endpoint, a lot of people don't think that uh, uh, ransomware is actually, uh, it could be a form of data breach if you lose ransomware. If, you're, if, if ransomware encrypts the files on your computer, a lot of people don't see that as being a data breach, but actually it would be. If you lost access to that data because ransomware encrypted it, encrypted it and you didn't have a backup or uh, the, uh, you know, the availability of that data wasn't, you know, wasn't accessible for like two, three, four days, causing a loss of service to your customers or something like that. That counts as a data breach. So, you know, when we talk about like endpoint security like that, well, we can talk about state of the art, but actually there's commodity products like, I mean, so for instance, uh, you know, endpoint antivirus is what you would class as like a commodity product. That's not state of the art. Um, of course, I'm from a security vendor, so I know that we have technologies that we would class as state of the art, things like our Intercept X product, which does anti-exploit, anti-malware and anti uh uh, sorry, anti-export, anti-ransomware, root cause and analytics and, and, uh, and advanced forensic cleanup. And that kind of product would be classed as state of the art. But also because it then tells you to take that into account, what is the best thing you should be implementing it? So you always start at going, right, well, what's the best thing? You work your way downwards from there. So you always make sure you know what's the best, uh, uh, best way you should be protecting data. But then says the cost of implementation. Well, that, that's where you then have to sum up the price of something. But let's say uh, you know, the, the fine you could incur could be a 20 million euro fine, but the cost of implementation would be you know, 100,000 uh, euro pounds. When they, t you know, the GDPR is then, you know, this would then say, well, look, you haven't taken into account the state of the art and the costs uh, of implementing it uh, to ensure that you implemented an appropriate technical and organizational measure to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. Okay, so it's bonkers, right? I, I think I ho I've already ha hammered onto this to, the, to death, but, but what we've got here is, is a bit of legislation that is very easy for you to not be compliant with. That's the biggest problem here is that it's kind of up to them what is appropriate. And it means that year on year, the GDPR will always change because we always have to take into account the state of the art, which means you have to review your security netting on a yearly basis because you know, things will change, new technology will come out, 
previous state of the art will become a commodity product. And once a uh, previous state of the art is commodity and you haven't implemented it, then there really isn't an excuse that will be a, a breach of the GDPR should you have had uh, some kind of breach, uh, you know, or loss of data or anything like that, where you hadn't implemented what is almost seen as a standard product. Okay, hopefully I haven't bored you too much. Let's jump now onto a fun fact. I say it's a fun fact, it's a rather scary fact. Um, so looking at uh, information is beautiful, uh, the source of data, looking at all data breaches since 2004, we can account for about 7 billion records of personally identifiable information being breached since 2004. 7 billion records. Now this is, of course, grossly under, you know, underestimating the true value, the true volume of data that's been breached because, of course, not every organization announces a data breach. But 7 billion records have been breached. And just to point out, there's only 7.4 billion people on Earth. So everyone listening, it's uh, almost certain and almost guaranteed at this point that you've had your data uh, breached as part of some kind of hack or something uh, over the past sort of decade or so. So to graph this out, let's look at data breaches over time. So data breaches didn't start really picking up until kind of hitting into 2012. Uh, and this is where we started losing huge sums of data. And I, you know, this is where uh, organizations like Yahoo's billion uh, account, you know, billion, uh, a billion records uh, uh, data breach in 2012 is, is kind of uh, kind of highlighting this kind of upward trend of data breaches. So in 2017, to date so far, we've lost 2.2 uh, billion records of personally identifiable information in this year alone. So far, we're not finished yet, so I'm sure we can do better. Uh, that's a joke. I really hope we don't lose any more uh, data. But, but what, what this kind of, you know, taking into account this kind of upward trend, it means we could be anywhere between 2.4 or 3 billion records lost in 2020 in a single year alone if we don't do something about it. And this is what GDPR is trying to react to. It's trying to sort of uh, tackle this, this ever-increasing number of data breaches and force it downwards by finally giving the law some horrible and scary teeth to, to brandish at us should we not have implemented uh, good security te you know, techniques and processes and solutions and so on, but also to sort of kind of, as I said at the start, put fire under our feet to get us moving, get us reacting. Uh, you know, I think those big fines are there just to scare us. I, I, I hope uh, when, you know, once we finally start seeing uh, some case law coming out that we'll see that it's, they're not actually going to find people uh, to that extent unless it's just truly grossly negligent. So, okay, so 7, so seven billion records are uh, lost so far, 2.2 lost in 2017 uh, total, uh, you know, to date. So what's, what's the main cause of these data breaches? So looking at PRC's sort of report in 2016 on data breaches, it covers that basically 57% of all data breaches is due to hacking and, or malware. So the vast majority of all breaches are hacking and malware. I'm sure we can all understand why, you know, uh, both from ransomware, breaking it, you know, to encrypting our data, to people remotely accessing databases, to, uh, the, you know, external attackers popping in, you know, getting inside our environment, you know, popping a couple of hosts and hopping from, you know, laterally moving around our network and hoovering up as much data as they can. There's even malware, that sort of uh, data exfiltration malware as well, that, you know, it's a, a malware that gets inside your network and steals Word documents or certain sensitive file types, et cetera, et cetera. So the, ne next, the next biggest re uh, sort of cause of a data breach is an unintended disclosure, i.e., you know, when we accidentally attach the wrong file to an email that we're sending out, you know, to the wrong person or something like that or, or anything like that. That's what we talk about, unintended disclosure. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, then we've got like portable devices, mobile devices, and, and, and things like that being uh, uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, stolen, et cetera, or, or just data being on those kind of portable devices where they shouldn't be. So they're, you know, they're, they're all around on USB sticks and we can't you know, control where that data is. And there's also then the physical loss, you know, loss and theft, uh, another cause of data breach where a laptop's stolen or something like that. Now, okay, so we can see here that the two things that we should probably be most concerned about, or primarily be concerned about, is hacking and malware. We should then should be concerned about things like unintended disclosure, and finally probably then start considering the, the other sort of uh, parts of our, our, our other major causes of data breaches. But I often say this is go for the low-hanging fruit. GDPR is coming. We should start implementing uh, solutions and so on that tackle the main causes of data breaches. The easiest way to minimize your risk is tackle the biggest causes of that risk. And if you can mitigate that, that kind of uh, may, you know, one of the primary causes uh, and, and put as many sort of pr uh, measures in place to protect you against that scenario, well, you can then you know, display to a uh, supervisory authority that you've kind of done a lot of good you know, effort and diligence to, to protect that data. Um, now, even though 57% of data breaches is caused by hacking and malware, what about the actual data that's lost? All those records that are those individual records of personally identifiable information. 
you know, where are they, you know, where, what's the primary loss of those? Well, 91% of all actual data that is breached is lost through hacking and or malware. So if we if we actually think about it, really both is hacking and malware the most likely cause of data breach, but also is going to incur us the biggest loss of data as well. So really this is, should be our primary focus on when we're trying to protect ourselves uh, from data breaches, uh, etc., to be compliant with the GDPR. Uh, this is uh, some data just coming from Sophos, but I just want to talk about the actual threats that are out there. What should we really be concerned about? So the biggest threat at the moment, as, as we can probably guess, is ransomware. You know, ransomware has been uh, incredibly popular uh, due to the fact that it's able to generate so much revenue for, for criminals. And so we're seeing them really push it quite heavily. But you know, GDPR doesn't sort of dictate what you know, you know what forms or, or cause of a data breach should be uh, taken into account, or you know, and that, that's what it, what's going to incur a fine. They're taking into account you know, just the data itself, and they don't really care how it is lost. I mean, there is some talks about you know the, about the availability and, and uh, re uh, resilience for data, etc. You know, whether it's if you're running a service, whether that's online good uptime for it as well as you know if you've made you know got backups of that data etc cetera, etc cetera. but that means things like ransomware can really impact our ability to uh, to, 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 to be compliant with GDPR if ransomware gets onto our computers onto our network shares onto our servers that could take down uh, take down our, our services for a period of time that could impact our customers and the availability of data is also something that then is, is a breach of the GDPR but also uh, you know if that ransomware gets into the file share and actually encrypts our data and many variants of ransomware actually target our backup solutions as well. They actually want to encrypt our backups because, so let's be honest, they're just really evil. Uh, you know, that means that ransomware can have a really nasty impact uh, and actually could mean that we're getting some form of fine uh, for not having good input, you know, technologies in place to protect against it. Um, exploits. Now, this is a this is something that we, we've seen a massive uptick in, in recent years. This is ultimately the underlying techniques and methods that bad guys compromise software. So this isn't just a, a .exe or a malicious file. This is abusing the fundamental way that software works. It's very advanced, and previously only nation states, governments, and spying agencies and the like were really leveraging this kind of uh, these kind of uh, attack vector. But as we've seen the rise of things like Metasploit and, and kind of the open source community sharing this information, we've now found that exploits and, and so on vulnerabilities can be abused with very little knowledge. Uh, and that's what's caused this huge uptick in exploits and it allows bad guys or criminals to automate the entire compromise, you know, the compromise of an endpoint so that all they really need you to do is go on a website and they can compromise your entire endpoint. And of course, phishing, phishing emails have always been uh, and will continue to be uh, a, a key way of trying to trick people either to clicking into links or opening attachments uh, to start off that attack chain. What's happened is that our attack surface just is huge now. We've got so many laptops and desktops. You know, I personally, even in the room I'm sat in, I have five different devices. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but there's different operating systems and, and different form factors and different purposes. And that means each one of these has different vulnerabilities that could be abused by a bad person. But also our attackers, they've got very advanced. You know, gone are the days are of just making an annoying .exe that when you accidentally ran it, it would change your mouse icon to a dancing person and play strange music, and that would kind of be it. Now we have you know very advanced crimeware where they're trying to either steal your personal data, your you know, your bank account information, uh, or your, uh, your personal actual data itself, as in like your files and so on, uh, and even trying to just steal your uh, your actually trying to force you to pay the money through ransoms and things like that. And they're using every single technique they can to sort of uh, evade detection. And to back this up a little, Sophos Labs, you know, here at Sophos, we're a security vendor. We see over 400,000 completely unique, unseen samples of malware every day. So we've never seen this file before. 400,000 totally unique bits of malware daily. And actually, of all that malware, each, each bit of malware we see, 75% of all those bits of malware we see, we only see within one organization. Which means what's happened is that our attackers, they're pretty much generating unique malware each and every time they attack someone. By creating unique malware, this is called polymorphism or polymorphic malware, but by creating a unique part copy of malware, it evades a lot of the kind of cheaper and basic AV solutions and, and network protections. Uh, but also then, you know, it gives them that kind of upper hand uh, against us and puts us on the back foot when we're trying to protect ourselves against it. So I want to quickly talk about risk for a second, because um, security engineer Ben Hughes, who works at Etsy, made a really good point. Uh, basically, humans suck at identifying risk. Uh, I like to put, tell a little anecdotal story. If you remember um, back here, you know, let's say the last time you went to, to get an airplane, you know, a trip on an airplane, I'm sure at some point you had someone say, have a safe flight. 
have a safe flight. Of course, planes are the safest form of transport we've ever invented, and actually you're more likely to die and or be injured when you're at home. So really, if anyone's telling you, you know, well, just before you leave, have, to have a safe flight, they should really be pushing you out the door. Get out of the house. It's dangerous in here. Get out of the house. You're statistically safer outside of it. And of course, then you get into your car, a very dangerous form of transport. Statistically, you're far more likely to be injured in a, in driving to the airport than ever being on a plane. But again, we still identify this risk of flying in planes. We don't understand that it's a risk that's been heavily mitigated against, and actually, it's actually very well secured. And so our problem is that when we're looking to protect our organizations, we're often implementing the wrong solutions. We, you know, we're implementing crazy uh, you know, software and solutions to protect us against really rare scenarios when we've forgotten to implement a password manager that saves our users from using the same password on every single system, or implementing uh, you know, endpoint antivirus to protect against advanced you know, up-and-coming threats. You know, instead, you've gone and done some crazy door security to protect your physical security instead. You know, we've got to make sure that the risks that we're trying to model, so we, we think about the threats, we've got to model them and understand the risks associated with them. Uh, and then start using things like risk registers to start logging all the possible risks we can think of and how we're going to mitigate them either immediately or in the coming months or the coming years. Also, I want to talk about culture because um, I, you know, I've worked in the security industry for a long time and one of the things I always find is that uh, there's often a little bit of resilience to certain solutions, primarily things like encryption, uh, because it changes the experience that our end users receive when they're going about their daily sort of, uh, workload. But the problem is that if we've got an insecure culture, you know, if, if our risk uh, that you know to, to data loss is because we're doing things incorrectly, because we're letting our users work in ways they shouldn't be, to ways that the GDPR isn't going to accept because we didn't want to bother or annoy our staff, but then that's why we didn't secure our data. That's not going to be allowed. So we're going to have to make a cultural shift. Okay, I know we're kind of, I think I'm probably just pushing on the edge of time, so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what Sophos can help with. Uh, I don't want to do a hard product pitch, you know, please look at our portfolio, we've got a vast number of security products for a whole well, uh, realm of uh, from everything from your networks, to your endpoints, to your mobile devices, and so on. Um, the first thing is we've got to stop those uh, stop stop the top causes of data loss. We talk, I talked about the low-hanging fruit. We've got to be using things like our intercept X products to protect against malware and ransomware, and we've got to sort of use di disk encryption to protect against our devices if they're stolen, and mobile device management to protect our and monitor our devices and make sure they're encrypted and can be remotely wiped if they're lost as well. Then we've got to look at protecting things at the perimeter of our networks, looking and reviewing our firewalls, our email appliances, our web appliances, to make sure that they're not falling behind the times and to review the kind of state-of-the-art technology that's in place. You know, uh, you know, intrusion prevention systems and firewalls are uh, kind of a de facto feature these days, and I still find many organizations that still don't have them. And the same thing with email appliances, web appliances, you know, sandboxing technology to scan inbound uh, you know, file attachments and downloads. It's very, you know, it's, it's kind of very standard technology these days, and it's something that you know, I think would be expected of you to have implemented to protect uh, your organization. After that, we then look at these kind of rarer cases, like uh, you know, when the, your users make mistakes. And that's where you can use things like Safeguard or encryption for the product to encrypt individual files, and also use things like um, Sophos Fish Threats, which is our, our sort of uh, our email phishing attack simulation and security awareness sort of. Uh, sorry, security awareness and training platform so that you can sort of fish your own users and if they accidentally click the link, you can then give them some training and help your users be aware of the threat and educate them that way. Also, what you should really be doing as well is learn more about the GDPR. I know a lot of organizations still haven't even made any kind of progress towards protecting against the uh, uh, their data or, or reviewing it in, in comparison to what GDPR is going to impose upon us. And we need to just you know, flick through it. It's about 300 pages or so. Uh, most of the pages only have a few paragraphs, sometimes only a couple of sentences. It's not too long a read. And I do implore that all of you have at least a good flick through the GDPR and see what's relevant to you. Then it start expanding your readiness and you start looking uh, with easy to implement data security solutions. Go after the low hanging fruit and then start adding on those additional risks uh, uh, to mitigate the advanced risk when you're ready. Start again by the biggest risks and mitigate those. Of course, if you're uncertain, please seek legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. I've given you our interpretation of, of uh, GDPR, uh, but I'm sure you know a lawyer will be able to give you in more depth uh, sort, of, uh, sort of thoughts and, and their, their interpretations, but also they'll be able to review it in the context of your business. Your business is going to work differently uh, to another business, and so having that kind of bespoke legal advice may help you really tailor uh, your understanding of the GDPR to your business and what you need to do to be compliant. If you're interested in any of our products, hop on our website. We have free trials of absolutely everything. Uh, you don't have to wait for one of us, uh, one of our salespeople to create you a trial or something like that. They're all registered for it in five minutes. You'll be able to download or log into your account and start testing out the products. 
Finally, there is a compliance reference card. I know the GDPR is quite scary, so to help you get a start, hop over to sophos.com forward slash compliance, and on there you'll find our EU GDPR compliance reference card, as well as a short sort of 60 second questionnaire to sort of help you start thinking about what you should probably be doing to implement uh, security, uh, you know, what, what kind of security things you should be implementing to protect uh, your data. Uh, to try and avoid these horrible fines that the GDPR might impose. There's also plenty of other compliance documents there, reference cards for PCI DSS, etc., which will hopefully let you understand what kind of solutions uh, you know, can be, you know, are out there and really helpful and what kind of risks they can mitigate for you. So it's a really good starting point. Thank you so much. I'm now going to hopefully take some questions and answers.